My name's Roy Palmer, I'm 65 years old, and I'm a calligrapher, freelance. So, how long have you been uh, homeless? I've been homeless now for three and a half months in total. I split up with my girlfriend, and she traded me in for a younger model. <laughs> yeah, she's 67, and he's 30. No organisations have exactly helped. Uh, Hammersmith and Fulham Council said that I'd made myself intentionally homeless because I had a flat from them and gave that up and to move in with my girlfriend. And so they said, that's making myself intentionally homeless. And because I'm a single male, uh, I don't come under their priorities. And how do you feel today? Angry. Angry that, yeah, I'm angry that they just let people die in the cold, virtually. Um, nobody seems to be getting any real help. It's only uh, voluntary organisations that seem to be caring about, but the councils, they don't really give a shit. And what is the most difficult thing that happened to you on the street? The most difficult thing? I guess the most difficult thing is that you become invisible to people. Um, I'm fortunate in that I have my calligraphy and people see me doing that and they come and talk to me about that. And if I'm lucky, they might buy something off me. But the most difficult thing is you, you become invisible, except for two other homeless people who recognise that you're homeless. The homeless people who recognise that you're homeless. It's sort of muddled up. And um, in this community, like, do you help each other? How does it work? Do we help each other? To a certain extent, yes. We tell each other where to get free food from, um, where not to go, uh, help wives. Uh, yeah, I think we, we're pretty, uh, pretty solid except for the homeless that are drug addicts and alcoholics because they're not interested in helping anyone but themselves. So other people that are homeless through situations similar to mine we seem to help each other. Um, yeah. And is that comforting? Yes, it is comforting. Because you know that other people, you're not the only person in that situation. Um, and we give each other tips. Uh, like, uh, where's, 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 who's, who to go and see in authority, like uh, Citizens Advice Bureau, places like that, the council. <laughs> the, but the council just, they don't, they don't care. It's one of the worst councils around here. After Chelsea and uh, Kensington and Chelsea Council, which is the worst one in London. Do you feel any judgment from people? Any judgment? Not really, no. I do get strange looks sometimes. Like if, I, if I'm really gasping for a cigarette and I ask someone, have you got a spare cigarette? Sometimes I say, yeah, sure, here, have one, have two. Other people, get a job. So it's like, uh, it's, which is understandable, I suppose, because they don't know who you are. And, but it, it does get pretty depressing at times when you're homeless because you don't know what the weather's going to hold. Like today, freezing cold. Last night was absolute murder. I was, I was in Chelsea and Westminster A and E for till two o'clock this morning, and the security guard kicked me out because he'd been watching me for the last couple of hours and noticed that I hadn't been registered as somebody who was needing treatment. So he kicked me out, and I said to him. 
Do you realise how cold it is out there? He said, yeah. He said, but this isn't a place to sleep. Yeah. I suppose he's doing his job, but it's a bit heartless. One of the most ridiculous things that I, I find is when a big issue seller asks you to buy a paper when you're absolutely penniless and you are part of the big issue of the country. If you, if you understand where I'm coming from on there. They say, well, buy the big issue. Well, no, I'm homeless. Yeah, but you must buy the big issue. What with? Yeah, with money. Yeah, but I don't have any. We are part of the big issue. And then they, they, they <laughs> I don't know where their heads are at. <laughs> And um, how long did you sleep last night? How long did I sleep last night? Perhaps an hour. And I was supposed to meet somebody in Pret, on Pret a Manger at 7.30. I was there because kindly he bought me a new phone. Well, a spare phone that he had because mine had broken. And he told me that he was there at 7.30, but because I was asleep, he didn't want to wake me up. So, but he bought me a nice little phone, so I'm very grateful for that. Um, yeah, but sleep, I, I don't really sleep. It's, you catnap. You maybe catch 10 minutes and you think you've been asleep for an hour, but you haven't. You look at your watch and 10 minutes has passed, so. And in this weather, so at five o'clock this morning, I was in McDonald's where I had a cup of coffee from the manager for nothing because I didn't have enough for a cup of coffee. And then at seven o'clock, I knew Pretz was going to be open and it's warmer there. So then I went to Pretz. And um, about your relationship, do you still in contact? Do you do that? No, my family are dead except for me. Can you answer with the Oh, question? sorry, yeah. Uh, am I in contact with my family? I wish I was, but I'm the last one standing, unfortunately. They have uh, all passed on. And last night, how did you manage to keep your body warm? Because the uh, temperature right now is pretty good. Uh, how did I manage to keep my body warm last night? Basically, I've got four layers of clothing, including this coat. Um, but the worst thing, and I found out last night, because it was, seemed to be colder last night than any other night I've ever experienced, don't wear leather shoes because your feet freeze. And you can't, I, I can't feel them at the moment. You are pretty well dressed and well presented. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty well dressed and well presented. A lot of people think when you, you say you're homeless, they look at you and they go, I don't believe you're homeless. And I say, why not? Well, look at what you're wearing. I say, oh, what does a homeless person look like? And then they give you the stereotype of what people think is a homeless person as being a, a drug addict or alcoholic whose clothes are, are dirty, but they don't expect you to be well presented. And yet there's a lot of people in London that dress better than m myself. And I know for a fact they're homeless. Could you talk about your work? My work, my calligraphy. Ah, yes, could I talk about my work, calligraphy? It's a passion. Uh, How did you get into it? I got into calligraphy. <laughs> it's quite funny, actually. So when I was 12, I had only one interest in life, and that was football. So in the summer holidays, it was six, seven weeks of it, we'd play football on the streets. But when I was 12, my father said to me, if you think you're playing, and it was the week before the summer holidays, he said, if you think you're playing football every day this year, think again. I said, why not? He said, go and ask your mum. 
So when I asked my mother, and I said, listen, he's just told me that I can't play football. What's that all that about? And she said, well, I'm sick and tired of you ruining shoes every summer and have to go and buy new pairs. My father was a sign writer, so he knew about lettering and he was also a calligrapher. So the first week I was mixing paints for him and then the second week he threw a book at me with all different fonts in it, for a pad of paper and a carpenter's pencil because I had a, a wide, wide nib. And he said, practice making letters. I said, what for? He said, just practice making letters. They'll stand you in good stead one day. And yeah, sort of, it's about the three weeks into it, I got a bit of praise from him. And I thought, that's bloody hell. You, you don't get praise from my dad about anything. So when you get praised for something like that, it was like, oh, I'm doing well. So I carried on then became interested in it. And then the interest faded. It, it's, it's, for years and years, it's been there, gone, been into other things. But in the last four or five years, it's really become a passion. Um, and I'm, well, I was a member of the Calligraphy and Lettering Arts Society. And I passed an exam with them, which qualifies me to teach calligraphy. Uh, whether I ever will, I don't know if I'd have the patience to actually teach somebody. But um, it's something that I have to think about because it brings money in, so. And uh, I sit in prep every day at the moment and do calligraphy and people buy it sometimes. But I have other things I, I do, silk screen printing, mirror engraving. Uh, these are all things that I was doing when I was with my girlfriend because we had a shed that I turned into a studio. Uh, that's all gone. <laughs> <laughs> um, does your passion, your business, works well? Yeah. It keeps me satisfied in my, mentally, my business. Um, it's, does it go well? Sometimes, yeah, it goes very well. I met a lady the other week who's got a gallery, pop-up gallery, Annette, and she's letting me do stuff in her gallery and she's got a load of my calligraphy that she's going to try and sell and I've told her to take her commission. And uh, how did you manage to get the help to have uh, or the accommodation for it to stay? Okay, so I met a guy a few years ago called Steve. He's the, own, the owner, well, he's the CEO, I don't know if he actually owns it now, but he, he's the CEO of Ovo Energy. And he put me up in the Hotel Lily for five weeks nearly. It's cost quite a lot of money. And then he said, find a uh, studio and I'll front the deposit and the first three months rent. Um, I think he would have done six months rent if it had been necessary, but I found a studio local to here, in Parsons Green, and he paid the deposit and three months rent in advance. And I moved in there last week, and but uh, Saturday night, somebody had had a bath in the studio above me, and They'd left the bath tap running and they probably forgot that they had even run it. And water was pouring through my ceiling because it was right above me. So I've had to, last two nights, be out in the open again. Do you know where you're going to stay tonight? I imagine tonight I will be Victoria Coach Station. Not ideal, but... It's still cold there, but if it rains, at least you're in the dry. Uh, yeah, I don't really think about 
things until like, until they I leave things till the last minute because you never know what's going to happen during the day. So I might meet an old friend who says, "Sleep on my couch," which is what I'm hoping for. But <laughs> but uh, yeah. Okay, so when I was on the street, properly, I had a friend who I believe is working in this park behind us somewhere. Um, he'd let me keep my clothes at his place. He had a small studio. And I'd go in the morning, have a shower, change my clothes. So that was always well presented. I mean, my bag there is just, they're all clean clothes, so. I had plenty of clothes to change into that are clean. So, that, because I think if you're well presented, that's half the battle. People will then talk to you. If you're scruffy, dirty, dirty clothes, smelly, then people don't want to know at all. So. And um, about like lyrical work, like making like uh, papers, for example. What paper do you have this week? Uh, at the moment I have, uh, I go to the papers, the, the materials I use, the pens I use, they're felt pens, although I have dip pens. I, these are the pens I use, they're Stedlers and they're calligraphy felt pens, so they're double-ended. So you have a thin nib, which looks, Hold it up. Yeah. you thin nib one end, which has gone a strange colour probably with the cold, and at the top you have a thicker nib. So I can do different letter sizes, and that's from, they're only sold in Ryman's, and Ryman's are stopping selling them, so I have to work out how to get them online. And the paper I use is uh, 160 GSM packs of 100 from Ryman's as well. And I need a ruler and a pencil, a pencil sharpener and an eraser. And I can work. And the beautiful thing about these felt pens, a normal felt pen, if you write something and then rub a line out, the ink will smudge. For some reason, you can rub these lines out straight away and the ink doesn't smudge, so it's pretty damn good. Um, do you have a bank account? How does it work? I had a bank account, <laughs> but the bank said that there was a lot of uh, suspicious goings on. It was when I was an art agent for a guy called Christopher Batty, a very good artist. He's now in a nursing home. And my bank account got closed because they said it was too much suspicious activity going on in it. I think they thought it was money laundering because there was thousands of pounds coming in and then thousands of pounds going out because they'd pay me as the agent and then I'd pay Chris. And it was like craziness. It was So after that, I've just been using uh, friends' banks' accounts like if I get a, a, a lot, mostly my bank account is the bag. I, know, I, know, I just hope it doesn't get robbed. But this bag's been stolen once already. You got it back? Yeah, I, the bag was stolen in Victoria Coach Station. I was having a wash. The bag was beside me. And the bag disappeared. I thought, oh shit, someone's stolen my bag. So. I, I reported it stolen and they told me to go to the left luggage office at Victoria train station to report it. And I went there, described what was in the bag, gave them my details, phone number, etc. The next day I get a phone call from left luggage. We think we've got your bag. Oh, really? Somebody had stopped, whoever stolen it, has looked inside and seen art materials and thought that nothing for us. So I just dumped it by the McDonald's and yeah, I got the bag back, which is quite a surprise and there was nothing missing. 
So that never happens. No, I mean, I, I couldn't believe it. But the bag's a bit old and tattered now, and I discovered yesterday that there was a hole in it. So I have to be careful what I put in that bit. But uh, as you can see, the straps, the straps have gone. Uh, yeah, it's it serves its purpose well. What's the most precious thing you have? Telephone is the most precious thing I have because I use the telephone for entertainment, i.e. television, uh, Instagram, texting people, phoning people, emailing. Uh, and when my phone broke the other day, and it broke because my hands were so freezing cold, I put my hand in my pocket because I heard the phone go. As I pulled the phone out, the phone went flying. <laughs> and then it was just damaged beyond repair. So luckily, the guy this morning, as I told you about earlier, he's given me an iPhone 7. So it's probably an upgrade from his old one. So. And how do you do when you have paperwork? Do you like an ID card? Um, I've never really come across a problem. Uh, because if you stay in a hotel, if I get money and I stay in a hotel, for instance, if you're English, you don't have to show any ID. If you're a foreigner, you have to show ID. So, but the only advantage of being in this country, being British, is that you don't always need ID because they can tell straight away, as soon as you open your mouth, that you're English. And uh, what would you like to say to the council? To the council? What would I like to say to the council? Hmm. I think it would mostly be in French. Uh, I think the council should look at themselves they should look at them, take a serious look at themselves in this weather and say, do we really want people on the streets who can earn a living, but we don't give them the opportunity and we put them right at the bottom of the housing list? That's what I'd like to say to the council, why they do it. Some question about the government. <laughs> the government of this country. Sorry, yeah. Wait, wait a second first. Wait, baby. Is that French as well? <laughs> yeah. The government. Let's wait. Let's wait. Okay. Oh, you've, you've got good hearing to hear that. What would I like to say to the government? Which government? Because, I mean, at the moment, We've got a government run by somebody that nobody elected. Although they elected the party, but not the Prime Minister. We had one Prime Minister for 44 days. Must be a world record. Uh, the Conservative government, they don't give a flying fuck about homeless people. Uh, if they did, there's enough empty buildings, there's enough spaces for them to solve the problem overnight, but they don't. The only time the government do anything is, with homeless people, is that they want to clear them out of an area because tourists are coming in. It's like, there used to be on the King's Road lots of homeless people sleeping in doorways. They cleared them out because that land, most of the King's Road area is owned by Cadogans and the Cadogan Estates and they don't want homeless people in that area. So yeah, it's, it's a problem that's going to go on for years and years and years. They'll never get rid of homelessness. But I don't think they want to, I, I don't think they care, to be honest with you.
they've got their homes, they've got their luxuries. They, yeah, they don't have to worry about, can I afford a cup of coffee? Can I afford a packet of crisps? They don't have to worry about things like that. situation could happen to anyone. Do you have any advice uh, to these people? Yes, uh, advice to people, because this can happen to anybody. Everybody's a paycheck away from being homeless. My advice to men is, and to women, if you've got a council flat and you fall in love with somebody, do not move in with them. Or if you move in with them, do not give your flat up because then you will be intentionally making yourself homeless, according to the council. Um, my advice would also be, make sure that you've got enough savings that if something does happen, that you're not gonna be on the street the next day. Um, just make sure it doesn't happen to you, basically, because if it happens, you become invisible and people just don't care. Even friends, when you say you've become homeless, they treat it like it's a sickness, an illness, and it's, it really annoys me because uh, I met somebody the other week, good friend, member of the Chelsea Arts Club, which I'm also a member of, although my subscription has lapsed, but I can get that back. And I saw him and he said, we must, we must go for a drink one day. I went, yeah. I said, give me a phone number, Will. He said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm, I've become homeless. I won't answer his phone. <laughs> so it's like, oh, no, I don't want to go there. I might become homeless. Well, would, you, would you say it's easier to, to prevent? Because you're saying, like, let's protect yourself. Is it easier to, to stop it? From be, to, to, to take preventative action, like have savings, and it is once it happens, and it's harder to get back up. Is that reasonable? Yeah, I, I mean, if 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 you can prevent becoming homeless, you have to prevent it, because once you are homeless, it's a downward slope. Uh, they do offer you night shelters. I won't go into the night shelters because for the simple reason, once you start going, I've spoken to people, and once they start going into the night shelters, you've given up. Um, it works for some people, not for everybody, because you have to be in them by eight o'clock at night, and it's a different shelter every night of the week. So it might be a shelter in Fulham, it might be a shelter in Hammersmith, and you have to get to those places. And also, it's full of drug addicts, uh, alcoholics. I'm not having, saying I've got anything against those people. It's just that I don't want to be grouped amongst them. So I keep my independence probably at a greater risk to myself because I'm not sheltered. Uh, everybody has that choice, I think. But yeah, preve prevention is better than it happening. Okay, what do I want to say to people who've helped me? I want to say thank you very, very much because your help has been enormous and it's also been life-saving. And it's been, it's given me a, it's given me a sense of goodness about myself. It's not the word I'm looking for. Uh, it's given me a sense of self-esteem and self-worth. Um, where can people find my artwork? They can find it on Instagram. <laughs> where can people find my artwork? They can find it on Instagram. And my Instagram account is the scribe, but you s it's the lowercase letters and then underscore and then scribe, 
lowercase, and then 001 is my Instagram. Any last words? My last words, thank you for the opportunity for me to express what it's like to be homeless. And if anybody is out there watching this and wants to help homeless people, myself included, then please take the opportunity to do something good for somebody at very little expense, even if it's just to buy somebody a cup of coffee. Every little helps. Thank you very much, Rob. Thank you.